Hi from Heirloom Books at 6239 North Clark Street in Chicago, Illinois. I'm Jeff Helgeson, and today I'm taking on two books written a decade apart. The um, History of Tom Jones, a Foundling in 1749 by Henry Fielding, and The Life and Opinions of Tristram Shandy, a Gentleman, beginning its sequel um, presentation in 1759 by Lawrence Stern. For starters, it's been observed that, along with Samuel Richardson's epistolary works Pamela, or Virtue Rewarded, and Clarissa, or The History of a Young Lady, Fielding and Stern pretty much invented the concept of the modern novel. With Henry Fielding, this was in the form of a picturesque narrative exploring the ways in which an abandoned, illegitimate boy child came to obtain love and acquire a fortune. For Stern, well, beginning with the conception of the narrator, there is a wild journey through extensive digressions that make up what I can only describe as an amazing literary labyrinth. Okay, so Henry Fielding was initially a playwright who criticized the English government to the extent of bringing on an act of parliament in 1737 that created a formal means of censorship which drove him from the stage to the page where he first published a parody of Samuel Richardson titled Shamala, and then penned an anonymous pamphlet about a female transvestite who is sued in court by the woman she persuaded to marry her. Twice married himself, Fielding had five children with his first wife, and a few years after she died in 1744, he married his deceased spouse's maid, who had been pregnant at the time, and would eventually provide him with an additional five children. Of course, earlier in life, Fielding had once tried to abduct a female cousin on her way to church, but yet none of these things served to prevent him from eventually becoming the chief magistrate for London who established that city's first police force in 1749, the same year as the publication of Tom Jones, not to be confused with the Welsh singer of that name, which I suppose is not unusual, although the book was the basis of the 1963 motion picture starring Albert Finney as the title character. As for the story itself, told in 18 sections, a country squire, Mr. Allworthy, returns to the home he shares with his sister after an extended business trip to London and finds a newborn infant in his bed. Asking the housekeeper, Mrs. Wilkins, to care for the baby boy, a search of the nearby village locates a young woman, Jenny Jones, who is suspected of having been the child's mother, but she refuses to identify anyone as potential father. Squire Allworthy, whose three children had each died in infancy and whose wife had also died, decides to keep the boy within his household, naming the baby Thomas, Tom Jones, and taking his sister Bridget as the person who would be most likely able to raise the child. Frequently visiting the Allworthy household was a somewhat incompetent doctor who had been forced into his profession by his father against his will and as a result of some very poor skills, had acquired no financial standing. Dr. Blilfil, in hope of gaining some economic advantage, 
introduced his sea captain brother to Squire Allworthy's sister, and they soon married, producing a son, but then quickly became estranged with both Dr. and Captain Blilfil, eventually dying, leaving Master Blilfil to be raised along with Tom in the Allworthy home. Extremely different in their characters, the two boys become rivals, with Tom befriending such people as Black George, the local gamekeeper, and Master Blilfil perpetually seeking to curry favor with his wealthy uncle, Squire Allworthy. When Black George's daughter, Molly, seduces Tom and becomes pregnant, he plans to marry her, but then discovers that her child appears to have been fathered by a local philanderer named Bill Barnes, who had previously ruined a number of other young girls, at least one of whom had subsequently killed herself rather than face the social disgrace of unwed motherhood. Relieved of his responsibility to Molly, Tom becomes attracted to the daughter of a neighboring squire, Sophia Western, who, although returning his affection due to Tom having been a bastard, is prevented from marrying him by her father, who encourages Master Bliffle's intentions instead. When Squire Allworthy falls ill and believes that he is dying, he bequeaths a large portion of his fortune to Tom. But as he begins to regain his health, Tom, in celebration of the recovery, rushes off to drink the squire's health. Bill Phil then tells the recovered man that while he was ill, Tom had gone on a bender to celebrate his pending inheritance, causing the squire to both disinherit Tom and expel him from the household. Blilfil then gets his uncle and his neighbor to agree to an engagement between himself and Sophie Western, who then runs away from home to avoid the prospect of this unwanted marriage. On his way to London, Tom encounters a barber named Partridge, who had been suspected of having been the young man's father. And at an inn, Tom is discovered in the bed of a woman called Mrs. Waters, who, as it turns out, is Jenny Jones, Tom's suspected mother, just as Sophie arrives. Learning of this encounter, the runaway bride quickly leaves with Tom following her to London. <sighs> to make a long story shorter, it is finally discovered that Tom had not really committed incest and that his mother had actually been the squire's sister who had raised him, Bridget Allworthy. Learning about the deceptions of Blilfil, Tom's half-brother, as it turns out, Squire Allworthy decides to leave his fortune to his sister's oldest son, Tom that is, and with his inheritance assured, Sophie Western's father consents to a marriage between Tom and his daughter, and with the possible exception of Blissville, presumably they all lived happily thereafter. Now, uh, with regard to Lawrence Stern's novel, The Life and Opinions of Tristan Shandy Gentleman. First, some simple and straightforward facts. The beginning two segments of the book as it exists today were initially published in 1759, about ten years following the history of Tom Jones of Foundling. The remaining seven sections then appeared in segments during the next seven years. 
That said, I feel that I should further explain that the prospect of describing the book beyond this point, in fact, presents what appears to me to be some considerable challenges. As a result, I've decided to um, sample a few sections and then see how things progress more or less in the manner of the way the book itself unfolds. For example, from the opening section. I wish either my father or my mother, or indeed both of them, as they were in duty both equally bound to it, had minded what they were about when they begot me. Had they duly considered how much depended upon what they were then doing, that not only the production of a rational being was concerned in it, but that possibly the happy formation and temperature of his body, perhaps his genius, and the very cast of his mind, and, for aught they knew to the contrary, even the fortunes of his whole house might take their turn from the humors and dispositions which were then uppermost. Had they duly weighed and considered all this, and proceeded accordingly, I am very persuaded that I should have made a quite different figure in the world from that in which the reader is likely to see me. Following this um, opening sentence and developing a host of metafictional techniques that were later embraced by such writers as James Joyce, Virginia Woolf, and Salman Rushdie, even while he spent 16 years living in hiding with the exception of an occasional appearance on stage with the rock band from Ireland U2 following the death sentence placed upon him by the Ayatollah Khomeini because of a disguised allusion to the Prophet Muhammad in his novel The Satanic Verses. But, but I digress. As does Lawrence Stern throughout the whole of his novel. In fact, Stern even specifically states at one point, digressions incontestably are the sunshine. They are the life and soul of reading. Take them out of the book. For instance, you might as well take the book along with them one cold, eternal winter would result. In every page of it, restore them to the writer, he steps forth like a bridegroom, bids all hail, brings in variety, and forbids the appetite to fail. As a further example, the book purports to be an autobiography, beginning with the narrator's conception, which had been disrupted by his mother asking his father whether or not he had remembered to wind a clock. Betwixt the first Sunday and the first Monday of the month of March, in the year of our Lord, 1,718. But it isn't until volume three of the text that on the fifth day of November, 1718, which to the era fixed was as near nine calendar months as any hus husband could in reason give expectation that Tristan Shandy Gentleman was brought forth 
into this scurvy and disastrous world of ours. Between these two events, the second of which does not even take place within the original publication, what are presented include the central character's father's theories regarding obstetrics and the influence which an individual's name can have upon a person as clearly demonstrated in the song written by Shel Silverstein and recorded live by Johnny Cash during the 1969 concert in California's San Quentin Prison attended as an inmate by fellow outlaw country singer Merrill Haggard titled A Boy Called Sue. Tristam, resulting from an error of interpretation at the time of the child's christening, and carrying connotations from the Latin word for sourful, trist, producing a lifetime of negative consequences. Also addressed within the book are Tristram's uncle Toby's obsessive interest in siege warfare, the extensive prenuptial agreement which was established between the central character's parents and the various complications surrounding the obtaining of a license as a midwife for a widow within the village who was eventually assisted with the necessary fee by a parson named Yorick, who subsequently died but was purported to have descended from the deceased jester in Shakespeare's play Hamlet, the Prince of Denmark and the parson's wife. Speaking of parentage and the circumstances of nativity, Lawrence Stern, the author of The Life and Opinions of Tristram Shanty Gentleman, was born in 1713, the son of an English soldier stationed in Ireland who later transferred to Jamaica where he died of malaria, leaving his son attending school in England at the expense of a wealthy uncle. In 1741, while serving as a vicar of the Church of England, although notoriously flirtatious, Stern married a woman named Elizabeth Lumley, who is described in Bergen's introduction, that's Bergen Evans' introduction to the 1950 Modern Library edition of the novel as a nagging woman of belligerent virtue who went mad a few years after their union. Stern's sermon, the Sunday following this union, Evans points out, was based upon a verse from the New Testament of Luke, we have toiled all night and taken nothing. Not being faithful either during or after his wife's brief confinement within an institution for the treatment of her apparent mental illness, she chose to live separately from her husband with their two daughters, seeking substantial support when his book became a source of a major financial windfall, which her husband apparently supplied gladly, claiming that the separation had constituted the very best years of their marital union. Suffering from recurring onsets of tuberculosis, Stern moved to France for the climate and began an affair with a young wife of a much older official in the Anglo-Indian government named Elsa, who was then forced by her husband to return to him in the subcontinent, with this estrangement from Stern resulting in a publication entitled Journal to Elsa, which recycled many of the love letters that the author had previously written during the courtship of his wife. In terms of Stern's place within various literary circles, Although he had become wildly popular among a large portion of the reading public, um, Dr. Samuel Johnson refused 
to remain in the same room with him. Oliver Goldsmith openly attacks Stern's writing, and a publication called the Monthly Review even describes Stern's sermons, which were published pseudonymously under the name Yorick, as the greatest outrage that had been offered sense and decency since the establishment of Christianity. Even though Stern became an influential advocate for the abolition of slavery, and about 70 years later, Karl Marx apparently was a big fan. Lawrence Stern died in 1768 and was buried in England, but according to a Wikipedia article, is reputed to have been exhumed by body-snatching resurrectionists like those employed by Mary Shelley's Dr. Frankenstein to provide him with raw materials, who tried to sell the corpse to the anatomy department at Cambridge University, where it was recognized and then returned to its um, final resting place. Of course, Tristan Shandy had his share of mishaps as well, such as accidentally being circumcised as a child while urinating out a window because of a missing chamber pot when a maid named Susanna allowed the sash to drop. Anyway, to borrow from the end of Stern's novel, a character asks, what's this story all about, to which the answer is a cock and bull and one of the best of its kind I ever heard. Literature, as demonstrated both by Lawrence Stern and Henry Fielding, can surely be fun. But borrowing a reference to a tagline from the 1980 motion picture Airplane, it can, of course, surely be serious, but don't call it surely. Next time, it's a broad view of the early romantics. I'm Jeff Helgeson, and Heirloom Books is located at 6239 North Clark Street in Chicago, Illinois.